live in the studios here at WLCN. Call number WLCN. Oh, the other call number is. 6485510. And somebody might have some questions of our uh, county extension uh, director of three counties, John Fulton. Uh, always glad to have John up with us. Uh, it's never, uh, never uh, much of a problem to reach in there and come up with some extra knowledge that we'll never be uh, <coughs> exposed to. And John has those uh, uh, that information at his fingertips. Um, John, tell us a little bit about the uh, the big word that came as a result of corn mold because of our, our moisture problem, or lack thereof, I should say. I would assume that's aflatoxin, and that's actually a mycotoxin that's produced by a fungus, an Aspergillus flavus fungus, and uh, it's kind of a green uh, fungus that can grow on ears, particularly during drought years, or I mentioned off-air, it was usually during storage, mm -hmm. so uh, if you have high moisture grain that is stored and has this fungus in it, you can have aflatoxin problems. Um, and then basically there are feeding levels at which point it's toxic to livestock. Oh boy. So uh, it can even go through cattle, dairy cattle into milk and so forth. So okay. that's created a whole different issue for livestock producers and even the grain producers in some of their marketing because we had some fairly high levels and mm -hmm. over 300 parts um, per billion basically renders it not usable for some chains that will produce livestock feed or human consumption and so oh, that forth. that's going to go into cereal making. Well, and is that's that a different kind of corn usually as well. But, uh -huh. oh. but uh, the levels go down based on the age of the stock and what use. And so uh, finishing stack. cattle, for example, uh, it's 300 is the level, and it gets down to 20 for young young mm -hmm. animals, Calf young, young stock, yeah. Calves, baby uh -huh. pigs, that kind of thing. So Now what do you do with this crop then if you have the aflatoxin? Is that what you that's, said? That's the actual toxin that this mold produces. Uh -huh. so, uh, then it's it's been a real nightmare for the grain handling system oh, yeah. to get it tested, segregated. Um, they did get a special blending thing. It's actually against uh, rules usually to even blend good corn with it to reduce the levels but they did get a blending certificate mm -hmm. passed for Illinois finally really so that they could but there wasn't any good corn left from last year oh. with which to blend with which to blend yeah and uh -huh. basically kind of it was <laughs> it was everywhere so you couldn't say well we'll take it from northern Illinois and where it's zero and do it somewhere else, you know. And Is that what up. we could see, John, as you drive by a field prior to picking and you saw a lot of black? Uh, no, I actually, didn't. that would have been just sooty mold. Um, uh -huh. If you've ever had an apple tree and it gets like charcoal dust on it, that's sooty mold and it comes from sugars and uh, the plants died. So they got trapped with sugars up in the silks and the husks. And so the sooty mold's a secondary thing that comes in. There's no harm to it, but that's what the black was. It was on the silks and the husks because it died with sugars up there. And so this opportunistic fungus came in and turned it into... Is that what you were trying to explain to me on the way up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Right. I, it it, so it sure. happens, but the same thing will happen to your apples late in the season as they get a lot of sugar in them, and it'll just look like somebody has sprayed charcoal water on them. I'll be darned. Yeah. So w were these various fungi uh, rampant around here then this year? Yeah, you couldn't tell what color of combine people were driving after a while. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh no, they goodness, were all yeah. black. <laughs> you know, you're oh. used to seeing a dirty yeah. uh, dirty field when they go through beans. Yeah. This year was nothing compared to uh, the, yeah. uh, the bean dirt, dirt was nothing compared to the corn. Oh. But, but the aflatoxin uh, is more of a greenish fungus. It's hard to explain, but if you ever see it, you'll recognize it, and it'll even glow under a black light. Really? Yes. So if, if you got some of the kids' old black lights down there, yeah. <laughs> you can actually Turn take it on. and shine it on, and it will be iridescent under that black light. Oh, my. Um, another crop that we have around here, uh, last uh, spring, 
I went up to Funks Grove to s see the oh, maple uh, syruping yeah. installation up there. It's very interesting. If you haven't been there, yes. you'd enjoy it. Um, now, my brother lives in northern Minnesota, but he didn't get but maybe a quart of maple syrup. How did it work around here with the drought? Did that greatly affect the uh, production of the maple syrup? Well, you're talking Funks Grove, is it, around here? That's <laughs> so it. Huh? I hadn't talked to them. I'll we have to, actually were up at my uh, brother-in-law's, one of them in central Wisconsin, and some friends of theirs were doing a lot of syrup uh, making. You know, they usually do... <coughs> 500 gallons or something and uh, they they said they were surprised that they got as much uh, sap as they did so um, I guess it was kind of dependent on the locality and I think it was a later season for some of them than what it normally is as well uh -huh. it's uh -huh. another type of agriculture isn't it now John sure. are you familiar with other uh, areas such as we have up here just north of us Funks Grove uh, you know of any other areas around here well, it's what you call it, I guess, uh, anymore. A lot of uh, the specialty operations are um, catering to an experience type of thing, whether it be a corn maze, a pumpkin <coughs> okay. patch, yeah. um, even some of the organic things. And we have all of those things in our area, but mm -hmm. not an abundance of them, but they tend to... Uh, provide an experience for a family to come mm -hmm. out for the day to select the pumpkin and do some of the other things, learn mm -hmm. about this, that, or the other. So you're not just going to buy a bag of apples or a pumpkin or whatever. It's it's kind of taking in the family whole experience thing, yeah. because mm -hmm. it's not the norm anymore. Mm -hmm. Tell me about uh, is, uh, beekeeping. Is that still uh, evident at all around us? We have a couple producers that are larger scale. Um, Sangamon County has had a resurgence. We actually offer a beginning beekeeping class in conjunction with the uh, Lincoln Land uh, beekeepers in Springfield that people can go to. And Springfield actually, honeybees were actually classified as livestock. Yeah, that right. So Springfield just passed a rule that exempted them from the livestock requirements, so you can now have hives in certain parts of the city of Springfield. So I think we're actually going to put in a demonstration garden with small fruits, tree fruits, and a, a beehive out at the uh, new extension office in Sangamon oh, really? County. That's something you and I can do in our spare time. Raise bees? Yeah. yeah, just just be a worker and <laughs> enjoy the fruits of your <laughs> this labor. Be the worker bee right here. I think I'll uh, just go to the store yeah. and buy honey. <laughs> that's quite a, that, yeah. That's quite another uh, uh, interesting avocation, or in some cases, vocation. I guess yeah, sure. maybe. Um, that's a pretty big deal to get that started, isn't it, John? Well, uh, you either want to be really small scale or really big scale. I think you I don't see. want to be stuck in the middle. It's uh -huh. about like everything else, uh, uh -huh. whether it's. Uh, corn production or swine production because the economies of scale you get bigger and better more efficient equipment better utilization of your time the larger you are and if you're real small you can do it in the kitchen and you know on the back porch and that kind of thing and That's in between it creates all kinds mm -hmm. of uh, labor and equipment problems mm -hmm. you know you're going to spend weeks doing uh honey from a couple hives on the stove and so forth where you know if you actually have the equipment then you may as well do a lot of it i can see you and gene doing that well we'll just we'll just get ourselves some you know, hives here. I, I can give you a couple names you can just go experience yeah, it okay okay do that john <laughs> what Please. about this uh, problem with the africanization of, of the of our bee population uh, well there's lots of problems in the bee area and Number one, they're very important as pollinators, especially mm -hmm. for the specialty crops, whether it be vegetables, fruit trees, whatever. But <clears throat> they're coming down and probably finding that some of the insecticides that we have used that have long lives and go throughout the plants, like the things you pour on for your Japanese beetle control on your linden trees, it actually even goes into the pollen and so they're wondering if that might be causing part of it and so uh, it used to be African bees and it was mites in the hives uh -huh. and now they're 
calling it hive collapse, where a whole hive will suddenly just die. So they're always searching for answers, and I think we'll probably see some best management practices at the least and regulation at the most, you know, to try and address that because they're so important as pollinators to uh, especially specialty crops, and that's from a production standpoint. You as a consumer, Judy, uh, that's the everyday stuff. You go in and buy the melons, the it apples, right. you know, sure. the, all that stuff. A lot of it's pollinated by bees, either live or, you know. Who uh, would be the uh, best pollinators, Republicans or Democrats? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll avoid that one, Bill. <laughs> I think plenty of it has been spread over the last few months. Yeah, there's a lot of pollinization. For every, uh, on uh, every amen, corner. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was wondering about... It must be a whole industry that has to deal with the further we go, the more progress we make, the more we putz around with Mother Nature, the more problems we create for ourselves. <coughs> so it has to be a lot of people just like you who, who know what we're doing when we don't know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I think it's people smarter than me, but uh, yeah, they're always looking at that, and you know the whole global warming issue. You know, if you, you buy look, that, if you look back, it's been cyclical through history. I, I don't think we've helped it any. Yeah, well, I think that's probably <laughs> but, right. But um, you know, is it totally because of greenhouse gas emission or whatever? Then. You know, the scientists will fight over that till it freezes over. But, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it is cyclical. We've had mm. ice ages, and we've had times when it's been tropical around here. So uh, they didn't have greenhouse gas emissions back in the, you know, Middle Ages Those or ages, anything yeah. around The woolly here. mammoth. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's, it's cyclical, and I think most people would agree with that, but mm -hmm. we sure haven't helped it any. Bill yeah. touched on this bee business, and wasn't it a couple of years ago that they were really worried? You talk about the hive collapse, for instance. Yes. That that uh, they were having a terrible issue. Still are. With Is that right? the bees. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But it's, it's like I said, better? it's kind of it's kind of shifted. It was the wild bees and the Africanized wild aggressive bees, and then. Uh, no, nobody wants to be around a beehive that's aggressive. <laughs> I think not. <laughs> not even yeah. the most tenured beekeeper. Oh, you know, you like the so. nice docile honeybees that crawl all over you and leave you alone. Uh -huh. But uh, then it went to, like I said, the mites were actually, I think it's Verona mites was the main one that got into a hive and were killing the bees. And then you got into, now it's this hive collapse disorder, they call it. And that meant uh, it's kind of like sudden decline and dieback. They're really not sure what's mm -hmm. causing it, but it's definitely happening. So they're l looking at the combination of things probably that are leading to that because they are so important to food production worldwide. Now, the Japanese beetle you mentioned, too, wasn't that the one that looks like a ladybug? No, that's an Asian lady beetle. Okay, and then the, the Japanese one is the iridescent. Yes, the small fingernail size. That Are they not the smelly one then? Well, I don't know if you get a bunch of them and they're all in a pile and dead, they all smell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, those things are pesky. Well, they the, and the box elder bugs. Yes. I think that's what you're thinking about the stench. Well, Is that or, right? uh, stink bugs, that whole family of plant bugs have that odor to them, whether it's squash bugs, stink bugs, the box elder beetles, you know, all those things that uh, have that same body shape or in that uh -huh. group. Well, the great-granddaughter was with me a couple weeks ago raking, and there were all these box elder bugs, and uh, she's always been afraid of bugs for some reason. I don't know why, but she was quite taken with those, and I had to keep catching one more, one more, one more for her. And uh, we were very busy with them. But they get in the house all the time, too. Oh, and sure. all these kinds of bugs get in your house. And it seems like I just get through cleaning, and by George, there's another one. 
they like to be where it's warm during the winter too and basically that's what they're looking for this this time of year is somewhere sheltered um, if, if we get some more 70 degree days coming up this weekend they'll be on the sides of the garage in the sun because you know they don't really make their own heat but they sure enjoy it if it's there oh yeah and same thing with the Asian ladybugs we didn't have a lot of them this year uh, because we didn't have much for their food source you know it's the old biology uh, rabbits and coyotes thing. If you got lots of rabbits, you got lots of coyotes. And if you have lots of aphids and so forth, you have lots of the Asian ladybugs. And particularly the soybean aphids is when we tend to get the huge numbers of those. But uh, the box elder bugs had a banner year. Yeah, they're they're alive and well, yeah. and living in my front yard, <laughs> actually. For purpose of comparison, John, uh, for some of the younger listeners out there, um, describe the crops that were uh, commonly planted, say, 70 years ago, uh, versus what we're doing today on the average farm. And of course, the average farm size, too, 70 years ago. Well, back in the day, you know, 20 acres is what you could uh, plunk down your uh, script or whatever to get. And uh, if you were lucky, you got uh, 120, 160 acres scrabbled together. and. Uh, that would be the 70-year-old era versus the 120-year-old, which it was 20 acres. And mm -hmm. now it's uh, it's actually an interesting phenomenon that the largest growth is in the very large farms, but the even greater growth is in the very small ones, where they're producing flowers, melons, that kind of thing. That that's where that's the big growth now. That's the biggest growth is, is in the under 40 acres. Huh. And it's a lot Especially. of specialty production, whether it's tomatoes, peppers, you know, whatever. How about the hydroponic uh, growth? Well, the hydroponics is, uh, okay. The biggest thing with any um, system that is under glass is the energy cost whether it's a regular traditional greenhouse or a hydroponic type greenhouse because it takes a lot of dollars to heat those facilities uh, provide uh, extra light and run the pumps and so forth mm -hmm. and that's why unfortunately some of the world-class operations like the pepper facility down in uh, Macon County did not make it because right? of the energy cost. Had to charge too much for their product? Uh, or it wasn't available in the market, mm -hmm. yeah, because uh, it, it's a huge cost. And uh, when you go buy these transplants to put out in your garden, a lot of these greenhouses used to run year-round, and now they'll only crank up when they have to because it costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know, last winter was fairly warm, so it wasn't as bad, but we paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we sure did. But yeah. the year before that, it was a fairly cold winter, mm -hmm. and uh, it, the energy cost, especially at the price of the energy, uh, has just decimated that kind of an industry. Do you have a crystal ball? Oh, I wish I did. Well, I wish you did, too, because I'd like to know, you've been doing this now here for 32 years, and I'm sure you've seen plenty of changes. Yeah. What in the world do you guess it will be in 32 more years? I... It's funny when I interviewed here because I, I moved here from Springfield uh -huh. in 83. <laughs> they said, what do you think your vision is? And I said, well, I imagine there will be one or two farmers per township, and I'm not <laughs> sure who they'll work for. <laughs> and oh, uh, Unfortunately, terrible. some of that's kind of yeah, come yeah. to pass, yeah, you know, yeah. because we have some very large farming operations. And... Um, Everybody also has the mentality that they're corporate, but in most cases they aren't corporate. Corporate farming is very rare in Illinois. You really? Know. Uh, they may have a family there. corporation, but there's mm -hmm. two sons, a daughter and her husband, and the father and mother in the operation, and they've incorporated for, you know, bookkeeping and tax purposes, uh -huh. but. It's still the family operation, but with the advent of being able to buy machinery to take care of a lot of the uh, physical labor, mm -hmm, they can mm -hmm. go much bigger. So same thing with swine it, operations, dairy is there any, is, uh Over there on the way, on Route 10, on the way to Champaign, there's a pretty good size uh, 
uh, I understand. Am I correct? Uh, I think that's the Incobrasa. Yes, that's yes. what. Yeah, that's a big corporation farm. Well, that's yeah. actually Brazilian owned. Brazilian. Yes, is, yeah, uh, yeah. but that doesn't mean that uh, they even farm it all, Bill. Uh huh. Yeah. In some cases, they rent parts of it out or used yeah. to. But uh, they're the landowners, just like, uh, you know, whether it's the Mormon Church, Catholic mm -hmm. Church, or, you know, the sure. Scoey family or whatever mm -hmm. it is, they've acquired mm -hmm. these holdings. But uh, a lot of folks, particularly in the extreme urban areas, think that it's all corporate because they see the DeKalb seed corn sign. Sure. So they think DeKalb is the one doing that, mm -hmm. but that's not the case, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just like putting up the Burma Shave signs along the road, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Kind of miss those. Yeah. Well, as we close, John, is there anything that you would tell the uh, the, the avid gardener, or just the occasional gardener? I, are they, you calling yourself the avid gardener? <laughs> no, I think not. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, I think right now. What do you be doing during the winter times? So what do you think as far as planning ahead is concerned? Well, that's it. They need to plan. Uh, right now, they probably need to clean off, uh, make the ugliness disappear. You know, because mm -hmm. we've had some killing frosts and freezes on the way. Mm -hmm. But uh, get the dead stuff off and that'll reduce the amount of disease carrying material for next year and then do a lot of planning uh, based on the size the light and so forth you don't want all your light being blocked by an l-shaped thing of two rows of sweet corn all the way around your garden you know and uh, you don't want your tomatoes spilling into this that or the other because uh, basically uh, space planning getting your varieties and we all look forward to getting the seed catalogs and seeing what the new varieties and so forth are. But the planning really does go a long way, so you've got everything ready to go when yeah. spring allows you. And are you available for uh, consul uh, consultation? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Call the Logan County office at 732-8289. I'm not there all the time, but uh, we'll get back to you. Well, John, once again, we appreciate the fact you'd give up for your time today. Uh, it isn't like it used to be. You were a busy guy with Gogan County. Now you've got Morgan and, and Sangamon as well. So we appreciate your taking your time to come with us this morning. Uh, close this uh, discussion this morning about gardening and so forth. And I found this quote, Judith Kay. As you sow, so shall you reap, unless, of course, you're an amateur gardener. <laughs> Thank you for Viewpoint. <laughs> <laughs>